cells in order to fulfill their metabolic needs. Always they require amino acids, water molecule, several ions to be transported inside of the cell and also they need to eject out their toxic product or metabolic waste that is produced inside the cell. So movement of ions, water molecules and other amino acids is important process for cellular physiology. But there is a fundamental problem. For example, if we think about a plasma membrane, only the lipid bilayer, then only some gaseous molecule like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen can pass easily throughout the membrane via diffusion. But if we think about diffusion of small uncharged, especially polar molecules like water, urea or glycerol, it is very hard for them to passively diffuse across the membrane. The main reason for this is water, urea or anything, it, they are kind of uh, polar, but uh, the membrane head group is only the polar group. But while they would traverse across the lipid bilayer, they would also encounter the hydrophobic tails. Now that would make them so uncomfortable. And that is why the rate of diffusion is ultra slow. Now, large uncharged uh, polar molecules such as glucose, sucrose, etc., etc., uh, sugar molecules can also pass through the membrane. Now, small ions like hydrogen, potassium, sodium, chloride, etc., for them, the membrane is almost impermeable for uh, passive diffusion. Then, how does cell? actually take up these ions or these nutrients from the environment. So definitely cell need transport methods and somebody to help or facilitate the transports. So before going to that we should understand what is the thermodynamic constraints of transporting ions across the membrane. Imagine we have a sodium ion and we want this sodium ion to be traversing uh, across the membrane by passive diffusion and reach the inside of the uh, cell. So, but we cannot imagine the sodium ion to be isolated in the environment because it is always interacting with the water molecule and forming a hydration shell around the sodium ion. Now, the sodium ion, when gets inside the membrane leaflet, then it's a, a uneasy situation because the sodium uh, ion is charged where are the lipid bilayer the inside of the lipid bilayer is extremely hydrophobic environment which makes the sodium ion very unstable and it, it creates a huge energy barrier for diffusion no matter what after the sodium ion goes inside it also has to regain the hydration shell so all of these criteria pose a huge energy barrier now in terms of Gibbs free energy we can understand the Gibbs free energy change for this passive diffusion is pretty high and it's very hard to achieve this kind of energy change to move the ions across the membranes. But cells are clever. They have specific transporters, ion channels, etc. So if we think about a uh, ion channel, it creates a unique environment for passage of this ion and it's extremely selective as well. We would be learning about the selectivity mechanism later. But it can get rid of the hydration shell and easily allow the passage of the sodium ion or any other cat, uh, ion across the membrane. And the, for, for this process, the energy change is pretty low as well. So this is more favorable than passive diffusion and 100 times more fast. Now. If we talk about the transport methods or the ways of transport, we should talk about passive transport and active transport. Passive transport takes place along the concentration gradient. So let's say the ions would move along the concentration gradient and most of the cases, uh, this concentration gradient is the most uh, important driving force for the ionic movement. Now for active transport, it requires ATP for its uh, for the ionic transport, and it can drive the ions to move against the concentration gradient itself. And 
the energy that is required to move the ions against the concentration gradient comes from the ATP hydrolysis. So without ATP hydrolysis, active transport cannot take place. And passive transport don't require ATP hydrolysis, but what is similar between these two processes is both of them need some kind of transporter to transport the ions or specific molecules. So that is the similarity between the two. Now we try to understand the forces that is acting upon the ions when ionic movement happen across the plasma membrane. We imagine a portion of the neuronal membrane. So there are two kinds of force we can imagine. One is the electrical force, which is due to the charge separation across the membrane. And this electrical force is actually Q times the potential gradient difference. And other than that, there is a chemical gradient fo force due to chemical gradient as well. And these two force try to balance each other. Now, for example, we take an example of a potassium ion. Now, in the situation one, let's say the potential of the membrane is now reduced from 0 millivolt to minus 90 millivolt. So now the membrane becomes more a kind of a negative. That would increase the tendency of this ion to be attracted towards this membrane. Whereas in the situation two, if the membrane potential is made more positive, then what would happen? The potassium would be repelled away, right? Now, apart from the electrical force, the forces due to chemical gradient is also very important. And for example, potassium ion is more in the cytoplasm than the external environment. And that is why there is a into outward gradient exist for potassium ion movement. Now, we can calculate the exact membrane potential depending upon the concentration of the ion and we can calculate an a particular hypothetical point which is known as reversal potential a potential where there is no net ionic movement where the chemical forces and the electrical forces balance it, each other now since we know the potassium uh, concentration in the inside and the outside of the cell we can kind of understand the reversal potential of potassium is very close to minus 90 millivolts and a battery of ionic potentials actually govern the resting membrane potential of the neurons itself now we talk about the transporters which transport the ions across the membranes so the concept of transporters is simple so the transporter can bind, can bind to the ion and it can undergo a conformational change that would allow the release of ion on the other hand side of ions or other molecules in the other side of the cell or the inside of the cell now the mode of the uh, transport could be three different types. For example, uniport. Uniport means unidirectional transport. Symport means two molecules are simultaneously transported in the same direction, let's say inside of the cell. And antiport is just opposite to symport, like one molecule is going out of the cell, one molecule is getting inside of the cell. So we would try to see and whether we can understand all of these modes of transport by several examples. First, we look at uniport. So, the RBC need to be metabolically active and in order to perform all the metabolic needs, it need glucose to be entering inside the RBC cells, right? And this happens via GLUT1. And GLUT1 transporter is present in the RBC membrane. So, this is an example of facilitated diffusion as well. And here the GLUT1 transporter is the important factor. So glucose bind to the GLUT1 transporter, it undergoes a conformational change and kind of opens inside of the cell, releasing the glucose molecules to the inner side of the cell. And that is how the uh, transport of glucose takes place in the RPC cell membrane. And it is physiologically relevant. And you can understand the directionality is from outside to inside. So it's a uniport, right? Think about another example. For example, why we think the lysosome can maintain a very acidic environment? On the lysosome membrane, there are several transporters. Among them, one of the most important is a V-type ATPase, which pumps in 
hydrogen ion inside of the lysosome and that is how it can create a low pH environment, an acidic environment. Now, this is also a uniport because the hydrogen ion movement is from outside to inside. But the difference between this transport versus the GLUT1 transporter is the following. Here, the hydrogen can only pass if ATP is hydrolyzed. So this is ATP driven. So this kind of uniport is an active transport as well. We try to take example of a SIM port. Now, we look at the intestinal cross section. Now, here is the cross section of your intestine. Here is the cross section of your intestine. Here you can see the intestinal epithelial cells. Now, intestinal epithelial cells have SGLT or sodium dependent glucose transporter. Now, this sodium gluc dependent glucose transporter can take sodium along with glucose and both bind to the transporter. That lead to a conformational change which ultimately release glucose as well as sodium inside of the cell. And that is how we absorb glucose and sodium in, uh, simultaneously in our intestine. Let's, at the last, we talk about the antiport. In antiport, the ionic movement direction is just the opposite. One is going out, one is coming in. So we talk in context of neuronal membrane. So in the neuronal membrane, there are plenty of sodium potassium ion exchange pumps or sodium potassium ion, uh, ATPase. So these ATPase need uh, can uh, this ATPase has sodium binding pockets where three sodium ions can bind from inside, followed by an ATP hydrolysis, which would trigger the conformation change, and that leads the sodium ion to be released outside, whereas at the other hand side potassium ion can bind to the altered uh, state of this sodium potassium ATPase and followed by a conformational change which would allow the potassium ion to get inside of the cell and this is how the inside of the cell is uh, receiving more potassium ion and pumping out sodium ion. So whatever you can see is that <coughs> more positive charge are drained out of the neuronal membrane right so the neuronal membrane is kind of at the resting state possesses a negative potential and that is how resting membrane potential is negative now we talk about ion channels right now so there are voltage gated ion channels which open or close depend upon the voltage difference across the membrane so here the ion channel has taken in an ion and its conformational change lead to release of the ion in the other hand side now there are ligand gated ion channel which open or close due to binding of a ligand. Now here the ligand binds and as a result the conformation on the other hand side has changed which lead to ionic influx through that channel. Now you can find voltage gated ion channels all across the axon, all across the length of the axon, axon in a neuron. Whereas you can find the ligand gated ion channels spe specifically in the postsynaptic region. So these are few examples of several transporters, several carriers and ion channels used for ionic transport and transport of other important molecules for the cell. I hope you enjoyed this introductory video. If you like my video, give it a quick thumbs up and don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Thank you.